the first thing that really kindled my ambition to do anything like what I'm doing now is when I, when I was 13 and I became fascinated by uh, Bob Dylan. Um, I've been listening to kind of more kind of pop type music. And then I came across Bob Dylan. And um, I was, you know, because of my age, I was relatively late coming to him. Um, but then I went back over his catalogue. Um, and that's when I became fascinated by words. And, uh, and I discovered other great uh, singer-songwriters of that era, Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, uh, some others. But these were very important people for me because of this fascinating relationship between what seemed to be a very literary language and the music form and the way they performed it. And uh, so that's what I wanted to be. It seemed, it seemed to be the art form that, that I, I aspire to. And I, I did spend some time playing in folk clubs and uh, to very small audiences. And I, I've act, I actually did a whole thing of ha carrying around demonstra you know, demo tapes to recording companies and, and uh, making appointments with A&R men. I, I did that whole thing, but uh, quite rightly, I got nowhere. I think I... I, I learned an awful lot from writing songs. I wrote over 100 songs. I, I still write song lyrics, actually, for, uh, right now, for, for the, um, Stacey Kent, the you know, Grammy-nominated jazz singer. Uh, but, uh, I, but back then, uh, you know, when I was a teenager, I, I, I wrote over 100 songs. And I think that was part of my apprenticeship, to be a writer of fiction. And many of the things I learned writing songs, or, or being this bad singer-songwriter, I think became fundamental to, to my style as a fiction writer. And one of the things you point out there, there is something about that kind of singer-songwriter tradition that is very first person. More than that, I'd say there is something of the atmosphere of, uh, that, uh, of just one singer um, communicating with, a, with just a handful of people in a, in a room you know, with an acoustic guitar. That kind of atmosphere, that intimacy is something I still go for. Uh, when, when I'm writing a, writing a novel. Also, I think there are many other things I learned at that point. I think, um, I think the fact that when you're writing a song, when you, well, you don't have many words to use. I mean, you're very, restri you're very restricted in terms of the amount of words you can use. So, and because there is performance and music along with the words, you have to leave a lot of things out in the words. If the words are complete unto themselves, as, as poetry on the page would be, the thing will not work. And so this idea that a lot of the, a lot of the emotion, a lot of the meaning of what you're doing is, is hidden, is between the lines. It necessarily had to be between the lines. You had to leave things not... You, know, you had to leave things... You had to avoid making things too explicit in the words, to, to leave space for the, for the performance, for the music and the performance, the singing, if you like, and the music, so that, so that they had something important to do. And I think these are all things that I took into my um, writing style, and I, I think that that remains you know, core to my style today. At the time when I was accepted on the uh, creative writing course at the University of East Anglia. It was the only one in Britain um, that was a, an accredited master's de degree. And even at that university, um, it was not respected. The traditional English dons thought it was a ridiculous thing. It's just only because it was run by this very powerful and esteemed uh, novelist and academic, Malcolm Bradbury, that, that it was allowed to run. And even then, um, people didn't apply for it. Um, the year before I went, it, it didn't run because nobody had applied, and the same the year after. Uh, so there will usually be, you know, my year there was six, and I think it was the largest ever. And Ian McEwan had, had, was famous for having done that course 10 years earlier. And, but, uh, but beyond that, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't seen as a respectable way for British serious literary British novelist to start a career. You know, it was seen as a very strange idea. I, I wasn't even trying to be a writer at that point. Um, but, you know, I, I'd been working with uh, homeless people in London um, uh, for a year after I'd, I'd left university from, from studying my first course. And uh, I thought, well, it'd be very nice to do a, 
a postgraduate degree. And, you know, I applied to a number of things. Um, that just happened to be the creative writing one. I, I just came across it almost by chance. And it said that instead of a, uh, instead of a scholarly thesis, um, I had to just submit a work of fiction that was only 30 pages. So I thought, well, this sounds like a much easier task. Um, but of course, when I got accepted, um, I started to panic. I thought everybody was, you know, I was going to meet a lot of um, brilliant, genius, you know, budding writers, and I didn't have a clue how to, how to do this. You know, uh, um, and I'd been accepted on, on the strength of a radio drama I'd written. Um, and so I, I did actually rather panic. And the summer before I went to the University of East Anglia, I locked myself up in a cottage in the middle of nowhere in, in, in the west of England, in, in Cornwall, in a very remote part of Cornwall. And for four weeks, I, I, just, I just wrote and wrote and wrote. I, I hardly saw anybody else. And um, I kind of learned to write. There weren't texts. I mean, there, there, there just wasn't... I mean, it's hard to believe now, but there really wasn't a creative writing industry, if you like. There, it wasn't a discipline. You know, um, I, have, I have mixed views about the growth of creative writing as a kind of formal taught discipline. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, but anyway, that, for me, that kind of worked. I mean, there, um, but, this, but a lot of things happened to me before I got to that course. Um, and I discovered that I didn't think it was that big a leap from what I'd been doing already, you know, uh, writing songs and then writing short stories. And I see it, I mean, some writers, they talk about their, their early works, you know, the, the juvenilia. They, they often talk about you know, secret novels that are hidden somewhere in their house that are rather embarrassing. Um, my equivalent to those songs, that was kind of, I went through my adolescent autobiographical phase in those songs. So when I started to write fiction, quite seriously. I, I came in at a later point, you know. I, I'd already f gone through a lot of the typical phases. And I, uh, so my first novel, uh, you know, it's told from the point of view of, of someone very different from me, living in a different era, you know, um, uh, a, 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 a Japanese woman in her 60s, you know, recording the war years in Japan, uh, very different to who I was then, a, a young man living in England you know, um, in the 1970s. Um, but I, was a, I think I was able to do that because I'd worked through a lot of the typical stages that people go through. I felt it was almost entirely positive for me. Um, uh, it, I felt it took pressure off me. You know, I didn't have to worry about winning prizes. There was something about the climate in those days. Literary prizes seemed to be... I know that literary prizes have always been around in Britain as well as in the United States, everywhere else, but somehow they came, in, came into the public eye in a big way around the time when I started to write. Um, the idea that novelists could almost be showbiz, you know, was introduced into the, in, into the kind of air. And... Uh, People were being signed up for big advances and so on. And the, and the book prizes became quite glamorous things in, the, in that era. And so if you were seen to be a kind of writing young novelist, the, there was an enormous pressure on you in terms of prizes. Um, you know, I think that there's a parallel here with, with uh, rising classical musicians. They have to win you know, music competitions. Uh, the, it, all, something almost like that was going around, I would say, in Britain um, in the 1980s. And so I felt that winning all the major prizes by the, by the time I was in my mid-30s just took away that pressure, you know, because I, I, I always feared that it, it would distort my artistic direction. It would make me cowardly. It would make me play safe my novels could become a series of applications for prizes, you know, trying to second guess what, what uh, juries would like and what they wouldn't like. And so looking back now, I, I feel it was a real blessing that I, you know, I got the prizes out of the way because I, I never expected to win the Nobel. So I thought by the time I won the Booker at the age of 34, I thought, well, I, I, I've done the 
prices now. I can, I can just forget about prices, you know. I, and I think that's quite important because I think there's something about writing. One of the great joys and powerful things about writing is, it, is it's, an, it's a solo activity. You know, I, I love cinema. I love, you know, I admire theatre. These are collaborative art forms. Uh, and they produce great work. But um, there's, some, there's something special for me about the fact that um, when, you, when someone writes a novel, every, you know, it's just one person. When I'm reading a, a novel, I'm, re I'm communicating with just a single consciousness. I, th I think that's very special. And I think for that reason, it, it's kind of important that, that you know, a person is... is not exactly left alone, but I mean, we shouldn't think too much about the worldly aspect of a writing career when we're trying to create. And it's very difficult not to, you know, uh, live, if you're human. And to be liberated from worrying about prizes, where you are in the pecking order, you know, um, I think, I think that, that for me was a, was a tremendous freedom. Yeah, it is very conscious. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a technique thing, you know. I, 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 it, and it's not the, the you that the narrator in the remains of the day, for instance, addresses. That you isn't the reader. Uh, in all these books, um, what I tried, I, I like the idea of the narrator addressing a you, because their perspective is so small that they can't imagine that they're addressing anybody outside of their very small world. And so Stevens is a butler. The you he addresses is another butler, or at least another house servant of some sort, you know, in, who, who lives in this world of serving in country houses. What the reader is doing is the reader is kind of eavesdropping on a conversation between this butler and another butler. You know, that, that's the effect I, wa I, want to, I want to give. You kind of feel you're listening in on somebody who's... The, 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 what's important to me is that, I, that these books are, are, to a large extent, about what happens when your perspective is very narrow. The, uh, the, the books like The Remains of the Day and the one before that, they're, they're about people who, who desperately want to contribute something uh, to the good of the world. You know, they, they want to be proud of how their work contributed to something good. And they, and they're in many ways they're very decent people, but because they're they're not remarkable in their perceptive powers, because their perspective is so parochial and small, they cannot see where they fit in in the larger historical context, and they, and their lives, they find that their lives are compromised. They have contributed to unwittingly to bad or e indeed evil things, and it's just they're, they're unlucky. Stevens is unlucky because he happened to live through those fascist years. It's not his fault in a way, but you know his his career, his best efforts have, are entwined with those of the man he served as a butler, who who in this case turned out to be a Nazi sympathizer. Um, and so, in all of these books, it's very important to me to suggest. The, the narrow perspective, the small world that he cannot see beyond. Um, and this is kind of one of the things that I'm trying to portray. I'm trying to say that we are all of us. We all of us struggle to see beyond our small worlds. It's very difficult for any of us to have special perspective. And we all do jobs, just like this butler. You know, we all, many of us do our best. We work very hard and we create something and you know we offer up our services or whatever we do to somebody upstairs and it's often an act of faith that it'll be used well it'll be used for something good you know for a, there's a company or a boss or a nation somebody that's going to use it and you just hope your contribution is going to be used for something good but we often don't have the perspective to see what that what's really going to happen with our little contribution that's the fate of Stevens the butler I'm trying to suggest that many of us Perhaps most of us are in this are, are in this situation. We're we're morally and politically we're we're butlers.
You know, and, and so it's very important for me to create that sense that um, he, he can't imagine addressing somebody other than another house servant. And so, so there's always a you, and it's, it's, it's very deliberately, the you is very deliberately constructed to be somebody from his small world. That's part of what the modern world is, it seems to me. Um, and it's, um, it's not because he's a wage slave. It's, um, it's not because he, you know, he needs to make the money. It's because he, it matters to him. It really matters to him that he does his work well. His sense of dignity, his sense of self-respect comes from that. But somehow, being the perfect butler, as he defines it, seems to preclude human love. Um, it precludes a lot of things. Um, but it seems to me, a lot of us, you know, a lot of people I meet, um, we we live in that we live that kind of life now. I think there are many pressures in the modern world that, uh, perhaps even more so than when I wrote that novel, push people to have those kinds of priorities. This is a big question. Um, I've never quite figured this out. When is the best time to actually start doing the actual writing? You know, the writing of the words that go into the book. Never mind how many drafts you're going to do. When do you actually start the proper writing? Uh, if you start too early, you can't write certain kinds of books. You know, you can't write that kind of very carefully structured novel where something that happens on page 28 is picked up again on page 94 and there's a tremendous reverberation. You can't set things up in that way. You're kind of just improvising. Uh, but you can get some kind of strange force uh, out of that kind of serendipity and improvisation. And you can bypass your own senses in a way and surprise yourself, even shock yourself with what comes out. You know. However, as I say, you don't have the same kind of control. And so that question of you know, how much should you know about your story, how much research should you have done, not just, I don't just mean into the historical background, I mean research into the characters, the relationship, the relationship your fictional world would have to everyday reality, you know, um, all these things. How much of that should you already know before you actually start the book? And I've never been able to get settled on a consistent rule about this. And I think this is one of the most important decisions for any novelist. Putting, your, putting yourself on that, uh, you know, somewhere on that spectrum. Are you one of the writers, at least for this book, that starts with almost no idea uh, and then you end up with something beautifully messy that, that you can then shape and reshape if you want? Or do you p do quite a lot of planning? Do you know quite a lot of things? And then you, you proceed quite carefully. And there's pros and cons to, to both approaches. Uh, so the remains of the day, I had to do a lot of just straightforward kind of historical research, as a scholar would do. You know, I read a lot of. I was in the library a lot, reading about. I was reading actually, you know, things written at the time in the nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, political pamphlets, um, biographies of non-entities who thought they were terribly important. They would you know, write their autobiography. Um, there were a lot of aristocrats in Britain who felt, you know, the world should know all about them. But actually. The, that they were very revealing. Um, you know, I, I read fascinating things like Sir Oswald Mosley's um, autobiography. Mosley was the British fascist, the leader of the British Union of Fascists. Um, his kind of justifications for for what he'd done you know, later in life. These things were all fascinating. Um, so I did an enormous amount of historical research. Some of it was just in, for my interest, but then. Um, at some point, I had to start writing my novel. And I did this crash. I kind of experimented with this idea, and my wife colluded in this, that I should actually cut myself off from the outside world for four weeks, as much as was possible. And so I didn't answer the phone, I didn't go outside, I had an hour off for lunch, two hours for dinner, then I'd go back to work again, um, I think I used to just get Sundays off, but um, the idea was what would happen if I absolutely incarcerated myself into a tiny room? Uh, would, would the fictional world become more real than the world outside? You know? um, uh, 
I don't know why the word crash was used, but several other writers picked up on this and they, they started to say, well, I might try crash now. I, 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 there's no logic to it. But um, it, the first time I tried it was for the remains of the day and I think it, it worked very well in that in those four weeks, I think I had all the, the foundation for the book. You know, then I had to kind of go back and um, uh, you know, figure things out make it more stylish, get that voice right. But all the important things, all the important central artistic decisions were made in those four weeks. Actually, I had, I had done what I thought was more or less a finished version of The Remains of the Day. But the, the very buttoned up narrator, the butler, he, in that earlier version, he doesn't quite come through confessing his true emotions. He, he, he maintains his uh, front a little bit more effectively than he does in the final version. Uh, and what made me change my mind uh, was that um, between that penultimate version and the final version I handed in, I listened to a song by Tom Waits, one, one of the, another great singer-songwriter, remarkable artist. Um, and this is the power of this, that art form, you know, the, um, uh, its performance as well as the actual writing. And it's a, I was listening to a song called Ruby's Arms, but it could have been any number of Tom Waits songs. Um, and in the middle of that, it's, it's a song about a soldier that is just leaving, or somebody, you know, just leaving his girlfriend sneaking out in the morning uh, to get on a train. Uh, but there's a, there's a moment in that when Waits sings um, my, the words, my, uh, although my heart was breaking. And it's not so much the words themselves, it's the way he sings them. Because Waits sings, his voice sounds like a kind of a really rough, tough, hobo type character. Not accustomed to re revealing his emotions at all. And it's the way that this this emotion seems to break through all his customary defences. And this is all in that voice. You know that that is not the voice of a man who normally talks about his own heartbreak. But it, he just cannot hold it back anymore. And this is the power of song, when it's sung by a great singer and, a, and, and he writes great songs. You can do this. And, and I thought, oh, you know, I'd love to... Can I do something equivalent in my novel? Right, it's a novel, there is no singer but I've maintained this very buttoned up, repressed, you might say, controlled voice of a narrator all the way through. I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't I let him just break through? Shouldn't I let the big, big emotion break through just once? And would it have an equivalent effect? You know? uh, and so I, I changed things a little bit. You know, I, 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 had a, I, I allowed that armor to be pierced. I, I learned an awful lot from listening to, to music and songs. Um, I learn a lot from you know, other writers, but I, I learn a huge amount from watching films and listening to people like Tom Waits and Dylan and Leonard Cohen. I've never been a writer that actually directly addresses what you might call the immigrant experience um, or even uh, you know, ethnic identity issues. Um, so it, it's more nuanced in my case. I, I almost predate the era when people t thought, thought in these kind of more politicized terms. Uh, our family, I think we were the only Japanese family. It felt to me like we were the only Japanese family in the whole country. Um, you know, uh, I very, very rarely saw anybody who wasn't like a white English person where we, we were living. There seemed to be no uh, preconceptions on the part of um, the people of England at that time about how they should behave towards people like us. My father was a scientist um, and um, you know I, I actually f I, I fitted in very well in this small community in the home counties of England. I, I became a head choir boy in the local church choir and uh, uh, but I was the only kind of non-white kid if you like in in the area so um, so I think all these things in, uh, must have had something to do with the way I looked at the world. I also, I think, looked at Britain through the eyes of my parents. I was a five-year-old boy 
when I arrived in Britain. I, we spoke Japanese at home. I saw the world around me partially through my own experience, but also through the eyes of my parents who were expecting to return to Japan you know, within a few years. So we didn't have the attitude of people who had settled. It was very much more you know, the, the natives in this strange country, aren't they fascinating? And uh, I was always taught to be very respectful of their customs. But at home, th these weren't absolute values. You know, my, my friends had do's and don'ts. You know, this was the correct way to behave. That was not the correct way to behave. It was different for me uh, with Japanese parents. And they'll say, oh, the English, you be careful because the English think it's, you, you must always do this in that kind of situation. Although we don't, you know. So, so there was always a kind of a, I think, a slightly different perspective. I grew up with a different slant on, on the world around me. I started school at the same time as everybody else. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed my school years and made lots of friends. So it didn't, I don't think it would be right to say I was an outsider. But I knew, I knew that I was actually very conspicuous. Um, and that... I wouldn't call it fame, but to me, just locally and at school, every, I was used to the idea that everybody knew who I was. I was the Japanese kid, and, and I didn't know them, and that I was very conspicuous. And in many instances, I had a very small amount of time to either use that, against, uh, use that for myself or have it go against me. And so um, I was, I think, you know, I realized that, you know. Um, but, um, so in that sense, I think I was aware of it. But the, I would say the English people of that time in the communities that I was in, this is from 1960 onwards, looking back now, they were remarkably open and tolerant when you think that this is only 15 years after the end of the Second World War. Um, and my parents were, were welcomed. and helped. In, in fact, you know, my father was invited by the British government as, as a, to, to work on, a, on, on, on research here. I hardly read, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, I, I was like a typical boy of that time. You know? um, but I did go to a, a rather interesting um, experimental school before I went to a much more traditional secondary school at the age of 11. And that earlier period, it was, it was a, you know, 19, the 1960s, there was a lot of educational theory going around about modern methods. And, uh, and one of the... I think I was one of the beneficiaries of that. I think many people suffered from that, you know, academically. But I was a beneficiary in the sense that uh, I was. A lot of us were left alone to just write stories, if that's what we wanted to do. You know, there, there was some sort of calculating machine in the corner, and if you were a math genius, you could discover calculus for yourself in the corner. But if you you could paint in another corner, and you could write stories in another corner, and so um, a bunch of us did do a lot of writing. But uh, with very little scrutiny or discipline, and I think most of the time we threw ink over each other, and uh, uh, and we were writing kind of spy stories. You know, this was the era of James Bond and things like this, and we we're we we're writing our own James Bond stories. But maybe, yeah, you know, I think f from those times on, I I think I always felt that writing could be fun. It wasn't something that somebody made you do. People could do it. You know, um, I never feared. Um, the blank page. You know, I, I don't, writing doesn't necessarily come easy to me uh, at the level which I'm supposed to practice it. But, you know, if I was just left alone on a desert island to entertain myself with writing stories, you know, I, 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 could, I could do it endlessly. You know, um, it's only when I feel, yes, I've got to present something that's very structured, um, it has to it has to fall within a certain you know it has to come up to certain standards then then of course it becomes a massive challenge um, and I feel it's very important these days that, you know not to just write things for the sake of writing them you know um, when I read other people's writing I really value the work that seems to say you know it had to be written you know that this person really wanted to communicate this. Not that they were just fulfilling a quota, or you know, it's about time they published another book. You know, there's a difference between when someone plays a piece of music because it's really what they want to communicate at that moment, and when they're just doing it because it's their job or because someone's put a 
piece of music in front of them and said play. You know, and uh, but um, but yeah, I, I but I, underneath it all, I, I've always been quite confident that you know if you put me in a room and I had to make up a story, if I was if I was back in the cave days, you know, I'll be able to keep going for some time. <laughs> I'd started to read a lot when I, when I did my first degree. I, I, I studied literature and philosophy at the University of Kent in Canterbury. And that's when I, I think, really discovered reading. Because, um, as I said, I wasn't a big reader when I was a child. Um, uh, I think, I, and I realized this because I, I reread Jane Eyre recently by Charlotte Bronte. And I always suspected that she was the biggest influence on me. Um, it seems unlikely, but I always suspected that. And I, I used to say that in interviews, and people think I was just being smart and evasive. But uh, I reread um, Jane Eyre recently, and also Villette, her other great novel. And I just came across you know, episode after episode where I thought, oh my goodness, I, I just ripped that off from, from this book. Um, um, not, perhaps you wouldn't recognize it, but I, I did. You know, I, I, certain kinds of techniques, certain moments when you understand that the narrator is crying, not because she tells you, but because somebody watching her makes a remark. You know, uh, all, all these little things that I thought, oh, I used that in that book. Oh, that, that's straight up. Um, I think Charlotte Bronte had an enormous influence on me, and I think it's something to do with that use of first person. Um, the, and the evasiveness, the indirectness of her first person narrative. I mean, this phrase, the unreliable narrator, has become very popular in creative writing circles. It's, it's not quite that, but, but a very subtle use of, of the relationship between a narrator in a book and the reader. It's something I, I tuned in on, I, I homed in on you know, instantly when I, think I started to read, uh, uh, read Charlotte Bronte. But I tell you, my favorite author, novelist, is somebody who you probably wouldn't think was anything, who had any relationship to me, which is Dostoevsky. I've always um, loved Dostoevsky ever since I first read him. And um, he was one of the, one of the uh, you know, that, that was, uh, he, he, I think he's one of the reasons I started to read, you know, when I read Crime and Punishment when I was about 17 or 18. And um, Dostoevsky and Chekhov, for me, remain like two kind of, at two poles in, in terms of a way, you know, way to approach things. I love the messiness of Dostoevsky, the improvised... Yeah, the, I mean, a lot of it is, is a mess, but I, I like the way that strange, unexpected things have obviously come tumbling out for him that he didn't want to necessarily <laughs> have come tumbling out. On the other hand, you know, Chekhov, another great Russian writer, I've exemplifies this kind of you know, the calm, controlled, very carefully structured, understated kind of work. And I, I, I aspire to them both. You know, they're, they're two of my great heroes. Margaret Drabble was very important to me in that back in, say, 1974, 75, there weren't many contemporary British writers um, yeah, you know, people tended to be much, either much older, you know, or, or we're encouraged to read, you know, classic novels, you know, Victorian era novels. Um, so, w when I was um, nineteen twenty, there, there were two important, I would say, young writers. There were both women. One was Ireland's Edna O'Brien, uh, and the other was Margaret Drabble. All the girls I, I met seemed to, seemed to have, you know, rows of Margaret Drabble books. So I think partly I thought this was a good way to impress impressed girls, you know, that, that, that I also read um, Margaret Drabble books. But then um, I, I would say she, you know, she was very important in that um, uh, she showed me a way of... I realised that there was a way of writing contemporary fiction, you know, that it didn't have to be like Victorian fiction or uh, you know, Edwardian fiction, that this was... This was a, a young woman writing about uh, contemporary Britain, particularly a, a, a novel of hers, Jerusalem the Golden, um, uh, convinced me that, yes, it, it, you know, I, I, could write, I could write in a modern language. You know, um, but she, 
she seemed to use a lot of the techniques of traditional Victorian fiction, but somehow she had a way of writing. It, it, you know, it, her writing felt modern, and we didn't have um, obvious young writer models of you know, writers who are slightly older than us. Um, so Margaret Drabble um, was, uh, you know, was somebody who was very important to me, and Edna O'Brien as well. Um, although she, you know, she, she, she was much more kind of Irish, I suppose. But um, and uh, so I, I always mention this because I think, uh, in some ways, uh, Margaret Drabble uh, uh, was talked of, I think, rather unfairly uh, when actually my generation of writers broke through in the, in the early eighties. We, we were seen as the generation that was supposed to replace Margaret Drabble and her generation, and not just not just literally, but in terms of our concerns and the way of writing. But I always wanted to say, look, you know, I've always admired Margaret Drabble's writing. And I think these days people recognize her for the important writer she, she is. Oh, I got time to write, and I, I discovered um, that I really wanted to be a writer. Um, Malcolm Bradbury who I, and Angela Carter were my two tutors, um, both in slightly different ways, remarkable people to have as your tutors. Um, and uh, I had a different relationship with, with them. Uh, Malcolm used to run workshops, but only once every two or three weeks. With Angela, um, she appeared in the last six months, and um, um, I just had a one-to-one -one relationship. I used to go, go to her house in London, and we used to sit around and just talk about anything I, I wanted to talk about. She would make me lunch. And uh, we will just talk about writing. She didn't demand that she saw anything I was writing. She was very respectful. I was writing my first novel, A Pale View of Hills. She'd, she'd been in, living in Japan not so long before that. And, so, you know, and I was writing a book set in Japan in the, 19, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, we had a lot to talk about on that front. Um, we had fascinating conversations. Sometimes we challenged each other. Um, these were the things I got. There, there were no taught course. You know, there, were, there, were, there was no taught course element. We, we didn't have any exercises. Malcolm Bradbury believed in the, in the blank page. He told me this many times, then and subsequently. He, he wanted to make people face the blank page. He wanted them to see what happened if for 12 months a lot of the excuses perhaps that they'd been providing for themselves as to why they hadn't been getting on with their literary career, if those excuses were suddenly taken away, if they were given, given ideal conditions to write, would they turn out to be writers? Would they really want to write? And I think this is one of the really valuable things about creative writing courses. I think people discover, it's a good chance for people to dis discover if they want to write. Because many people want to be writers, I think more so than ever now, because it's a glamorous and you know, comfortable job if it works well. But um, a lot of people don't want to actually write, they just want to be writers. And you, you can't really have that title unless you really want to write in a very deep sense for its own sake, you know, the work for its own sake. And, and Malcolm believed in putting people in a very quiet, rather dull part of the country and giving them very little else to do other than produce some fiction. And sometimes a lot of people had a very painful experience, including in my year. They, this carefully nurtured idea of themselves as, that they had of themselves as writers started to dissolve during that year. It was very painful for them, but I think you could argue that's a very important discovery for some people to make as well. This is one of the things that makes me wary of the creative writing industry at the moment. You know, to some extent, it preys on young people, not necessarily young people, all kinds of people's um, delusions, uh, uh, as well as their ambitions. And if, if you're encouraging people who really have a chance of doing something really good, that's fine. But if you're just doing it because you need to make money for your institution, and you're encouraging particularly young people at a crucial point in their lives to devote their time and energy to an activity when they could perhaps be studying something else or going a different path. I mean, you know, so I, 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 have, I have all kinds of reservations about it, but when it works, 
it works very, very well. All these things, um, it, it, it becomes a way of, you know, it's another way of being a writer or being an actor or being a musician is to teach, you know, and so that's a natural way for things to proliferate. Uh, but you have to be careful when you're toying with young people's dreams. You know, I think there's a response, we owe them a responsibility and we can't just exploit that, you know. But, um, but as I say, when it works, it, it works brilliantly. And of course, many great writers have have either taught or come through creative writing schools, just, just, just as the musicians do. Robert McCrum was, uh, he's, he's just over a year older than me, but he had been given, very unusually for the stuffy kind of British publishing scene of that time, he'd been given the top editorial job at this very distinguished company, Faber and Faber, that you know, used to be run by T.S. Eliot. And it had, you know, had a very distinguished uh, backlist, but its fiction list had gone rather moribund. And uh, this very young man, I mean, he must have been in, I don't know how old he was, I might get this, 27, something. I mean, he had been given this, he'd been put in charge to, to really find a whole generation of writers for Faber. And um, I was one of the people he he discovered at that stage. I was then 25 years old and doing this, um, you know, writing uh, at the University of East Anglia. I think he discovered Peter Carey around that time and, and then a whole bunch of people. Um, he, he was a remarkable uh, uh, reader and editor and, and he had a real sense of um, uh, how to put together a list. But my relationship with him personally, I mean, we got on very well and his technique was, as far as I was concerned, he would do almost no close editorial work. We would have relatively short discussions when I submitted a book. But he had an uncanny way of saying, this part of your novel, there's something not quite right about it. I can't tell quite what you should do about it, but I have a feeling you should go and look at it again. And he, he did that with uh, we we worked together on the first four novels. He did that every time, and every time he was right. He could always he had a sense for what was wrong or if something wasn't quite working, and that that's what I really value in in, in an editor. And I have another very important editor. That, that's my wife, and um, you know Robert left publishing around the, after my fourth novel, um, and now he works as a very prominent uh, literary journalist, but, um, um, and an author himself. But um, my wife has been my consistent critic from before I started to write. You know, we, we've been together for a, a very long time. And uh, so when she sees my writing, she doesn't see the writing of some kind of you know, famous writer or anything like this. It, I'm still this upstart kid, this um, failed singer-songwriter who is having a go at writing fiction. So she criticizes me in exactly the same way that she did uh, when we were back then, you know, when I was just starting that course at East Anglia. We've known each other long enough so that we, we know where we differ, you know, fundamentally. So I can kind of, some things she says, I think, oh, well, that's our usual, you know, we, we've agreed to disagree on that kind of thing, you know. Uh, but there are many things we agree about. And so if it's on that territory and she says something, However painful it is, I, I have to, um, I have to, well, I'm tempted to say I have to obey, but, but I have to listen. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I mean, you're, I'm not sure if your question is alluding to what was very widely publicized about my latest novel, The Buried Giant. Um, she, she told me to abandon it after I've been working for a year and a half on it, because uh, in its current form, it just would not do. She said it just would not do. Um, and this was slightly distressing for me, but I, I did as she, uh, she suggested. I, I just stopped it, and I went and wrote another book. And then I came back to it, you know, fresh. You know. um, that, that's, that's one of the more extreme things. But um, now I think all, all of my you know, books like The Remains of the Day, I mean, um, uh, uh, I think the ending wouldn't be the ending we have now if she, she hadn't told me I had to go off and do the ending again, you know.
Well, Never Let Me Go, I'm trying to think. I think I, it was published in 2005. I started to write it, I think, about 2001. Now, now the date is very important because I would say from, for a lot of my literary life up to that point, I was under the impression that science fiction was a kind of a genre I shouldn't go near. Now, I didn't consciously examine that assumption. I think it was just something that I had imbibed, being a writer of my generation. It was not a genre that was studied in, at universities, unless you, know, it, it, unless you, you think of something like um, 1984 by George Orwell as you know, dystopian and therefore approaching sci-fi. But it's not a, it wasn't a respected genre. But then I started to make friends with uh, people, I, writers who, who I really admired, who were about 15, 16 years younger than me. Uh, the novelist David Mitchell, um, Alex Garland, who wrote The Beach and is now a, a terrific uh, direct, film director. Um, he made the movie Ex Machina recently, directed and wrote it. Um, and he indeed adapted Never Let Me Go for the Screen uh, as a screenwriter. Uh, but when I first met these guys, they, they did not have this prejudice about science fiction. Far from it. They, they, they were lapping it up hungrily for inspiration. They, were, they seemed to like um, uh, graphic novels or comics. Um, and I could see a, a huge energy coming from, from this generation. And they showed me that it was uh, all right. In fact, it was more than all right. It was almost... It was almost foolish not, not to pay attention to, to this whole body of literature. And I think around that time too, I and of course like everybody, you know, I, I became aware that the world was actually changing rapidly. You know, the, the information revolution, the, you know, the technological information revolution was all around us. And not just that, but we were aware that remarkable things were happening in biotechnology um, artificial intelligence. Suddenly, sci-fi, you know, far from being some sort of um, lowbrow, geeky, despised genre, seemed to be the natural place one should look. And I, I think I, I was really grateful for the, for the towards these younger, that younger generation, because um, they kind of gave me permission as a, as a writer already approaching fifty to. To, to use you know, a kind of a sci-fi premise because Never Let Me Go was a novel I had tried to write twice before in um, several years earlier and I just could not get uh, I could not get the metaphorical world in which the book could take place I toyed with the idea of um, young people who, who came across nuclear materials and so their, their lifespans had been limited it did, didn't really work and I tried various things like that um, it's only when I, when I thought, actually, it's all right to kind of do science fiction. There was, the, um, at the, around that time, um, a sheep had been created, Dolly the sheep, through, purely through genetic cloning. Um, I thought, well, if, if my characters were clones who were created solely to provide organs, uh, and that, and that they were, their fate was to lose organs gradually as they... But while they were still young, um, I thought, well, actually, this is kind of like sci-fi, but this is, there's something awfully familiar about this concept. It's actually, it's the human condition. For all of us, we have limited, we know that we have limited lives and that even if we're lucky at some point, we're going to lose control over bits of ourselves physically and, and then we'll go. And so the big question becomes, you know, what, what is important when you realize your, your time is limited? What, how do human beings behave? How do they prioritize when, they, when they're aware that time is very limited? So I thought I'll create this very strange concertina version of a human lifespan in, the, in Never Let Me Go. Let's have, let's have young people who are effectively old people. You know, let, let's take them through all those stages that the lucky ones go through in you know, 70, 80, 90 years, take, take them through that in 25 years. And what, what becomes important to them? You know, what, what really matters to human beings? 
All in all, I worked with homeless people for about a total of two years. I mean, because um, I went back to doing that kind of work uh, after I finished my first novel. Um, homeless people are not necessarily a category apart at all. They're 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 very different from each other. They're homeless for all kinds of different reasons. They have many they have many problems in common by virtue of the fact that they're homeless. But often there's a primary problem that's caused them to be homeless, your mental illness, you know, drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, whatever, you know, they're, they're, all kinds of different things are happening to them and that, that brings them to this place where they're homeless. And so um, I, I think in a way, and I, I feel slightly guilty about this. I feel guilty about the fact that I learned so much about people suffering in different kinds of ways uh, in a very short period of time. It's all, you know, if somebody devised a, a kind of a course, like a university course, to allow you to get an insight into how, how ordinary people just break up un, under the, just the pressure of life, then, then you, you could do a lot worse than, than work, work in the homelessness project. Um, I, I was living and working in this hostel where people were, were coming in. And... and um, you know, you know, of course, I was, I, you know, like a lot of my colleagues, I was doing my best to, to help them. But I, I'm very aware of the fact that, you know, I was in that world for about two years, then I left it. And I, I had a, it's almost like I had this kind of another university course, or a piece of education in, in people from all kinds of walks of life. But I, I kind of, a part of me feels like I exploited them, you know, that, that I... I watched them, I saw them at their most vulnerable. Um, I listened to their stories. I left and then became a novelist. Um, so there's a part of me that uh, I kind of make it a rule. I, I, I've never written directly about homeless people. And, uh, but obviously it, it affects the way I see things, the way I see society, the way I see political structures. Um, but I, I, to this day, I've never written directly about those people or, 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 or the work I did then. You know, and, and I learned a lot from those people. Those people, a lot of those people were intelligent and perceptive. I'm not the kind of writer who directly reveals something about myself autobiographically through an alter ego character. You know, I, don't, I think you'll struggle to find any character who who's kind of like me in, in real life. But my books, the, those novels are, are me. You know, I express myself through those novels as a whole, you know, not through any single character. Um, the way I try and, the emotions I try and express, the perspectives I try and present, I feel that, you know, that they are what I, they're, they're, they're who I am. They're, what, what I'm trying to say is, this is how I feel about life. You know, I presented you with a kind of story about a certain area of our experience, and these are the feelings I have about it. Um, isn't it the case that don't you feel that too? And, and that's not a rhetorical question. I'm actually really asking that. I'm saying, look, do, is it just me, or do you feel this too? Um, do we have a point of connection here? Uh, because I, I'm... You know, it strikes me it's like this. And sometimes I'm trying to access not obvious emotions sometimes, you know, uh, uh, nuanced or emotions that perhaps people haven't been aware of having, but, you know, it's been a large part of them. And I feel that that's, that's what I, I try to do in my books. It, it's a... It's... It, it's I mean, yeah. There's a, obviously there's an element of novels because they use words that 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 that, that might be um, that contain argument or that that represent a piece of history about the real world out there. But essentially, I'm a writer of fiction. I'm not a I'm not an essayist. I'm not a historian. I write fiction, which means I'm trying to connect with people through feelings. Yeah. Um, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to appeal to that thing which um, we all have as human beings, never mind the, the different borders.
and walls we, we, we erect. We need both, of course, don't we? I mean, it's, 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 we, we, can't, we can't get by in the world simply with facts. I mean, we need the facts. The, in some ways, you'd argue that you know, they become more elusive than ever right now. We need the facts, but we also need to know what it feels like to live with those facts. It's not just enough to know that some people are hungry. We have to have a sense of the pain of being hungry. Otherwise, we can't make the decisions. We can't relate to each other properly. And I think, um, you know, fiction, all the arts, you know, fiction, music, all the arts can do something about reminding us that, you know, we, we, we have human connections and we share feelings with each other. Um, and I, I think, yes, I think, you know, it, it, it's very important that we also have a way of communicating how things feel. These are very troubling times, but of course, the, I mean, the world has gone through. I mean, I, but let's not exaggerate, you know. I mean, if you look at the world for, for the first half of the 20th century, uh, particularly in Europe, um, it's a hellish place. You know, Europe, for the first 50 years of the 20th century, makes, makes the Middle East right now look, look like paradise. You know, it, it, was, it, it, it was butchery and slaughter and the most horrific mass crimes. You know. um, and um, you know, I think you could, you could almost say there was, a, there was a failure of culture there. You know, um, uh, the irony was that you know, the, these things exploded in a part of the world where culture was rather proud of itself, where people went to great, you know, where the great composers and the great novelists and great playwrights all you know, came from. And it was supposed to be the height of civilization. Yeah. And so it kind of makes, you, makes people like me nervous about overclaiming for what things like novels, what, what, certainly my novels, can, can do in a practical sense to stop conflict and war. Um, on the other hand, I can't help thinking that, yes, it is very important that, um, that we, we share things at the level that art can help us share things. And perhaps because perhaps you know, our, our works can cross barriers more easily because of because of great translators, because of a more internationalized publishing world and film world and television world, uh, and because of, because of the digital age. Maybe there's, there's a chance for the positive things about culture to, to have more of a real practical effect. But I do worry about the world as it is right now in 2017. In, in my lifetime, it, it's certainly one of the more worrying moments, politically and socially, I would say. You know, um, and uh, uh, you know, we don't have the time now to theorize about all the things that might be behind it, but um, um, one of the great achievements, I think, of the second half of the 20th century in Europe was to turn a place of utter carnage and hatred into a place of uh, you know, much envied liberal democ democracies, you know, living in a kind of more or less borderless Harmony, that, that is a complete miracle. And we seem to be retreating from that achievement, it seems to me. Um, I don't just mean because the, you know, Britain has elected to, voted to leave the European Committee. I mean, I mean, something bigger than that. There's something happening right the way across Europe. People are retreating in, into, into ethnic nationalisms. And I, I would dare say you know, that there is something comparable happening in the United States as well. Um, people seem to find it difficult to unite behind large, large ways to, to see themselves as a community. Um, they, they, I think there's almost a fear that people will be left exposed unless they can, they can find a little camp that they can join and from which they can lobby 
especially. It's almost like a, a children's party. You know, that you arrive, a, a kid arrives at a, a children's party and everyone is having a good time together and then suddenly a child realises that everyone is divided up into little camps. And then there's the fear. You've got to join one of these camps, otherwise you're going to be left out. And these camps are vying for against each other you know and so everyone rushes in fear to to these little groups and i kind of feel that for some reason many complicated reasons we we seem to be going through that phase in the western world at the moment the eccentric thing about the uh, uh the swedish academy is that they announced the uh, winner of the nobel prize I don't know what they do in the other categories, but as far as literature is concerned, they, they like to announce it to the world press before they let the actual recipient know. And so I'm not the kind of person who gets up in the morning wondering if I've won the Nobel Prize. I, I didn't know that the announcement was going to be that day. I didn't know anything. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't in my mind. It wasn't on my horizon. I, I was just having a normal day. I came down. I, I hadn't had a shower. I, I was... I think I, I was, my breakfast stuff was around me. I was writing an email at the kitchen table. And, uh, and, the, and the phone rang. It wasn't the Swedish Academy. It was people, you know, various people who had heard the announcement made in Swedish and thought they heard my name in the middle of all that Swedish. But they weren't sure. You know. So it was very uncertain. And uh, this long email I was writing to a friend in China actually tails off. I and mean, we were going through a lot of stuff. It actually tells that I'm, I've got to go now. I, I might have won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and that's a, I mean, it was literally like that. And within, the alarming thing was within about half an hour, um, there was a, a long line of um, press people with cameras and things um, you know, from our front door going up this suburban street. And uh, I don't know what the neighbours thought had happened. They probably thought I turned into an axe murderer and I was going to be <laughs> let out, you know, handcuffed and with a raincoat over my head. And I was, I was in the house alone. I, I, I had no, um, you know, I had to actually um, call the hairdresser where my wife was. She was about to change her hair color. And, uh, uh, and she had been building up to changing her hair color for about two months. This was a big moment for her. And I had to actually pull her out of the hairdresser. I said, I need some help here. You know, I, 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 I can't cope with this. There's, um, and, and she came, and, and, then, and then somebody came from the publisher, my agent came, and we had a press conference in the back garden. Uh, that's how chaotic it was. It was absolutely crazy. Uh, I mean, all the photographs, I mean, there I am, you know, just the way I was that morning. You know. <laughs> uh, so the lesson I learned from that is, you know, have a shower early. You know, do, not <laughs> uh, do not sit at the kitchen table assuming that um, yeah, there'll be time yeah, after breakfast. I mean, there won't be. Just, do it first thing, just in case you're given the Nobel Prize and the world's press turns up in your garden. I haven't really had much time to process it yet because uh, it's only about a week and a half ago and I had a very busy schedule lined up anyway before the Nobel thing happened. So it's just been really crazy. But I feel, and, and at some point, yeah, I, I, I'm going to, stop and think about what it actually means but I think it means a lot to me it meant a lot to me straight away not just because the greatest you know many of the greatest writers I can think of have gone before me and won this prize but also I think there is something about the Swedish Academy and the Nobel Prize which stands for I think it stands for something pretty decent um, and perhaps it is something that can help towards a good will and, um, and, and bringing people together at a, at a, at a difficult time. I mean, it, it, to me, the Nobel Prize centers around the Peace Prize. You know, that, that it's, its history is about you know, Alfred Nobel having invented dynamite and seeing the actual negative effects of that as well as positive effects, wanting to to, to leave this, this vastly profitable estate to help you know, world peace. And I think a lot of the, okay, I mean, there, there are all these other categories, but I think it's, when you win a prize, I think it's very important 
And who has given it to you? Do you respect the institution that's giving it to you? And then the other thing is, you, do, do you admire the people who've already won this prize? In both cases, I think, um, as, as with the American Academy of Achievement, uh, um, which is why I'm here speaking to you, I mean, if you, res if you admire what the institution stands for, then the prize becomes something very valuable. Um, I have turned down prizes in the past because I, I didn't want to receive the honor from the people who are offering it to me. But when you receive it from people you re really respect, then you feel you're truly honored. And also, when you walk in the footsteps of such wonderful people, um, you know, you, you, you do, I mean, it's a cliche, but you do really feel humbled, you know, so, um, and that applies to tonight at the American Academy of Achievement when I'm receiving an honor, and, and, and it, it'll mean the same thing when I go to Stockholm to pick up the Nobel Award. I thought that was wonderful. Um, he was, I know he was a little controversial, but I, I really admire the Swedish Academy's courage in, in doing that. Um, when I go to Stockholm, I, this is one of, my, one of the things I want to really find out. Um, the, the question I want an answer to, really, is was Bob Dylan being uh, honoured just for his lyrics as though they were written poetry? Are we... Were, were are we being encouraged to just ignore the rest of what he does and almost incidentally, if you use his lyrics as poetry, like the poetry of T.S. Eliot or Seamus Heaney, it's, it's, it's great. Is that why he is being given a Nobel Prize? Or is it a recognition for an art form which I think really came of age in the 1960s and 1970s? Uh, this this singer-songwriter art form which found its moment, I think, with the LP record, sophistication of recording techniques, um, this coming together of literature, music, performance. It's an art form that perhaps should be called literature alongside fiction, poetry and drama. At the moment, people just think it's just those three things, literature, but Maybe it's time to recognize that this has been one of the really important art forms of, of, of the past 60 or 70 years. Um, and that artists like Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, I mean, they are very, very significant and important artists. Certainly for, for my generation they are. And, and they are, I, I, I can't think of what quite how to categorize them. If, you, if they are not part of literature, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they would be, but I think they should be part of literature. So I like to think that the Nobel Prize for Dylan was also a recognition of what he does. He's a great singer. He's a great songwriter. He's a great band leader. Um, he's, I, I think that, I, I'm hoping that's what it means, not that he was a great poet on the page. I think I, I related to that very much at the time, uh, you know, because I was kind of like an adolescent, and the whole world was like that. I mean, it, it seemed to kind of have meaning and not have meaning, and I, I kind of put it down to my not being mature enough to understand the world, you know. And so lyrics that, that's, that, that seemed to have intentionality and direction and authority but didn't make a whole lot of sense kind of summed up my experience in the world, you know. Um, uh, and that, that certainly was part of the appeal, I would say, for, for, for a lot of people of my age at the time, why we were drawn to the more, let's say, abstract songs of Dylan and Leonard Cohen, rather than the more, rather than the clearer songs, like the protest songs that Dylan did earlier on. Yeah, everyone knows what that's about. But by the time you get to Blonde on Blonde or Highway 61, you know, things start to become very modern and very abstract. And... I think that was an exhilarating feeling, not just because of the age I was, but I think there's something to do with the era in which we lived in. There was a feeling that in the late 1960s, early 1970s, a whole world was opening up, which our parents didn't understand, which we didn't understand, but it was exciting. And we wanted, I think, we wanted perhaps lyrics and art, an art form that reflected that.
an exhilaration of adventure and exploration and meaning that is just slightly beyond our grasp. Well, this is always very difficult because this might feel like an evasion, but I feel it's very important that young writers figure out their own way of writing. You know, that generation needs to find a way of writing that's right for them. That will teach me. As a member of the older generation, uh, I'm 62, I'll be going on to 63 soon. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be looking to people like me. They have to invent something for themselves that is about, that reflects their world. And, you know, they, they understand what it's like to be the age they are today in a world that's rapidly changing in every sense. You know, I want them to show me you know, what literature can be. Don't, don't come to me for it. You, know, you, you teach me what, what, where literature is going. It, it's, it's their turn. They've got to invent it for themselves. So I don't, I don't want them to listen to my advice. <laughs> uh, uh, that sounds a bit of an evasion, but I mean, I think that's, I think that's right, you know. I mean, um, I think every generation of artists have got to do it for themselves you know, and, and take themselves seriously and with confidence. Um, and it, it's not always helpful that the old guard hand out advice. Having said that, I'll just, say, I'll just say one thing, and I'll go back to that point I was making about creative writing classes. There's so many people now want to be writers. Um, it wasn't like that when I was young, but you know, everyone wanted to be a rock star or something. It was much more sensible when I, when I was young, but now everyone wants to be a writer of some sort, and many want to be fiction writers. I mean, I would ask that very fundamental question, do you really want to write? Or do you just want the status of being a writer? Because it, it would only work for you if, if, you're, if you really, really want to write. And it's not for everybody. You know, it's, it, it, you'll be frustrated. You'll lose a sense of who you are and what you should do in the world. If you, if, you, if you press on with the idea of being a writer when you don't even want to write. So I think that's the biggest question people have to ask themselves if they're starting out. Not do you want to be a writer, but do you want to write?